Good evening, everyone. It's really my pleasure to be here. And I want to extend my uh, thanks to the conference organizers for including me in this program. And I consider this my uh, public health intervention. By making sure that you don't talk to, while you're eating, I make sure you don't choke while you're eating. So that's also um, a good way to, to uh, start the talks now while you're still um, enjoying your meals. So I am going to deviate a little bit from what we've been hearing about all day, which is more about the, the what uh, has been happening and what kinds of pr uh, great programs people have been doing uh, really all around the, the globe. I really love how this is quite an international conference with representation from every, every corner of the world. But I'm going to talk about more of the how we do this work. And my talk is about global health today and how we have to shift the paradigm. So uh, that'll become clear as I move forward. So again, to this very seasoned audience, I don't need to say, uh, you know, uh, tell you all about the importance of making sure that global health uh, our responses to the current global health challenges, which we know are complex and multifactorial, and that requires that our solutions are collaborative and interdisciplinary. And I know that's all well known to all of you, but I do show my, my um, students and junior colleagues and say, if you look at the picture of this woman, don't know exactly what country she is or, or um, more about her setting, but if you think about what it's going to take to improve her health overall, you know it's going to be more than just plonking down a clinic in that village with doctors and nurses is going to be really going to require kind of an all hands on deck response. And that's going to require us to work across disciplines and in teams. Um, being an academic institution, uh, our activities are focused in these three main areas. These are sort of the three legs of the stool of our global health work. Um, and that's focused on education, training, um, research, and then practice, what some people call service or I call healthcare delivery. So let's launch in. Again, being an academic institution, I just sort of summarized uh, how we approach uh, educating the next generation of leaders in global health. And I'm sure like your academic institutions, you uh, can also uh, categorize your activities into these, these main um, buckets. So first is the curricular and co-curricular activities, those activities that uh, train our students and, tra and, um, and trainees in the classroom and out of the classroom, out of the classroom on campus, but also maybe in the um, surrounding community. And we provide experiential learning internships. Uh, and these are across a wide range of areas. So in the, around health policy, we provide mentored research opportunities um, and community health and development. And we also feel it's really important to do proper pre-departure training for our students and trainees so that they will engage in their global health activities ethically and professionally. And then we also provide clinical training really up the spectrum of, um, from students, residents, and faculty. So up the spectrum of, uh, of uh, medical education. And I'm just going to share one slide about some of the programs that we're doing at, at, at Dartmouth. Uh, again, just to s so you can get a sense of of uh, what our academic uh, global health programming uh, looks like. And I always, I always share our programs from our Dardar programs in Tanzania. That's, that name comes from taking Dar for Dartmouth and Dar for Dar es Salaam. And my um, colleague, Dr. Tulib will tell us that it mimics the Kiswahili word Dada, which means sister. And we feel like that actually captures the spirit of our, of our relationship. So, with our DARDAR programs in Tanzania, I say we've, we've achieved the perfect trifecta there because we have programs that are focused on clinical care and service delivery. We, we together with our partners at Muambili University, established the first pediatric HIV care and treatment center to provide um, antiretroviral therapy to children living with HIV. We have very active clinical um, research, uh, 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 very uh, um, active clinical research site focused on TB. Uh, prevention and TBHIV sequelae. And then we also have a very um, prominent education and training arm. We've uh, been fortunate to receive several uh, training grants from the Fogarty International Center at NIH. And of course, when we talk about training and research, we usually use the metric of uh, numbers of publications that that collaboration has generated. And so I share some of those numbers here, but also another metric that we use, which is not just the number of publications, but how many of those publications had Tanzanian co-authors and first authors. And that's, again, a little bit, one small way in which we shift the paradigm or begin to shift the paradigm. Now, global academic partnerships sound like a great idea. 
that we can really make them a win-win situation for everyone. But again, I'm very I, cautious in reminding my students and, and colleagues that these are very complicated relationships. And I say the stakes are high because many times they're forged across this great income divide. And we have to remember that if we don't get these partnerships right, the consequences can be quite grave, right? We actually risk replicating the very inequities we seek to mitigate. And the consequences can include eroded trust, squandered resources, and continued disempowerment. And frankly, it's time that we stop learning these lessons on the back of our low-income partners, and we have to stop these preventable failures. So that's why I promote shifting the paradigm uh, in how we do global health. And let me give you some examples of how I think this paradigm should shift. So paradigm shift number one is about moving global health out of the realm of charity and volunteerism or volunteerism, where it has, has lived for many years, into the realm of global citizenship. We all want to create good global citizens. Into the realm of global health security. We want to keep our populations safe and, and free from disease into the realm of human rights and social justice, which is really part of the founding principles of uh, the global health um, movement, if you will, and really refocus things on partnership and this interdisciplinary collaboration. And really frame global health as an academic discipline, adding that rigor to the work that we do. And I often say, you don't really want a doctor who dabbles in internal medicine to treat your hypertension or one who dabbles in oncology to give you your cancer chemotherapy. I think we don't, we don't want uh, those who dabble in global health to be doing global health work. We really want to recognize that this is a uh, rigorous academic principle um, and be moving it in that direction. So it's beyond the sort of uh, feel-good moments with the, uh, the uh, ever-present selfie. Um, it's about asking the tough questions around volunteering this work and, vo and what has been called volunteerism, and again about aligning with other academic partners and, and organizations like the Consortium of Universities for Global Health to bring that academic rigor to this work. Paradigm shift number two. I really think we need to be eliminating that global versus local distinction because Really, it's an artificial distinction. As one of my colleagues said to me, our global, our global at Dartmouth and in the US, is always somebody else's local. I think we have to keep that in mind as we begin this work. We, what we find, however, with our students is that, interestingly, doing work in global settings becomes much more appealing to our students. So if you ask students, do you want to go work in this setting that I've shown here, they respond eagerly, yes, of course we want to work on a public health project there. There's opportunity. We see, we see tremendous need. We think we could be helpful. We think we could make a difference. But if you show them this setting and ask them if they want, want to work in a, a public health project there, they tend to decline and say, oh, that looks like it might be too complicated. The problems might be deeply entrenched. I don't think we could have an impact there. And now, what's the difference between these two settings? It's really, and the students' responses, it's all really in their difference in understanding the context. Because I assure you there that the problems in both of these settings are deeply entrenched and complex. And we need to get beyond thinking that there are, are you know, simple solutions. I say all the low-hanging solutions have already been plucked in every setting that we, that we work. So again, I'm all about sort of breaking down that global-local distinction. Paradigm shift number three is reminding us that it's not about pins on the map. Um, I say at Dartmouth, we place a high premium on quality over quantity. Um, and I heard some of that mentioned today as well. I say it's about bringing our learners to the world and the world to our learners. And one of the ways we do that is by practicing reciprocity. And we feel that that's actually very important for equalizing opportunities and benefits across the partnership. And I can tell you, when you do that, it changes everything. So I say, if we're going to send Nareth Carlisle, who's a, a, was a Dartmouth a Medical School student, to Mubambili, um National Hospital at Tanzania, we have to be willing to receive and support uh, J uh, Jacob Kagizi and, and Good Luck Liatu coming from Muhambili University to spend time at um, Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center. And what's fascinating is when the Tanzanian students first arrived at Dartmouth, my colleague said to me, 
you know, Lisa, this is really hard. The students arrive and they don't know our medical system or our medical record, and we really have to orient them to everything. And yet, we think nothing about sending our students there and about the burden that we're going to place on our international hosts to orient them and welcome them and teach them. So again, I think once you practice reciprocity, you really get a better understanding of how you can work on these programs collaboratively and begin to think about how you want to pay it forward. And the last paradigm shift is just a reminder that it's, it's not about us and the, um, coming from the wealthy institution, the, <clears throat> the, um, uh, the uh, wealthy academic um, um, university. Never was, never should have been. It's really about placing the partnership at the center of the work that we do. It's about following our partners' lead such that their priorities set and drive our, our agenda in this work. I'll just mention one last um, concept, too, that's part of this last paradigm shift, which is around the concept of decolonizing um, global health and global health partnerships. And there was a conference held here at Harvard, um, I think, in, uh, in the winter, organized, I think, primarily by students around this concept. So I know it's, it's, been, it's been discussed in these hallowed halls. I think we need to remember to ask ourselves sort of who's driving the activities, who's benefiting from the work that we're doing. One of my colleagues um, advises his students of global health to, before they go overseas, to first do no good. And what he means by that is to remind them to sort of uh, slow down and not focus on their priorities and their agendas and their getting their uh, needs met and really um, gets them to sort of slow down and really focus on the partner's needs and, and uh, be better learners and listeners. So the, doing this work around co-designing, co-problem solving across orders, history, power dynamics, very complicated work and, and it, um, it's sort of an ongoing journey for us. But I do remind us, coming from the high-income countries, about watching our language, behaviors, being uh, better listeners than, than talkers. We, I tell my Dartmouth students, you get rewarded all the time for being outspoken and assertive and speaking your mind, and now I want you to unlearn all of that. And I want you to be much better listeners um, and guests when you're, when you're overseas. And again, reminding ourselves to uh, before we, we engage in this work to get a better understanding of the context and historical legacies and the places where we work. So I know Rwanda was mentioned a number of times today, and I had the privilege of um, being one of the first physicians to uh, work in the Rwandan Human Resources for Health program and spent six months in Kigali in 2012 and sort of share their, that model um, as a new paradigm that I felt Rwanda was uh, setting for us, where it was very clear that it was the Rwandans in charge of this, Rwandans in charge of this program, um, really <clears throat> setting the program goals and agendas for us, and really making sure that all solutions were Rwandan owned and driven. And it was, and, and that their um, learners, students, trainees sh should be prioritized, and that their communities, the health of their communities should be prioritized, and everything that we did there. And I say, you know, Rwanda was showing us um, a new paradigm, um, how we might do this work differently, but it also shouldn't be incumbent upon them alone to do that, and that we as their partners need to be uh, helpful and supportive in helping promote this, this new paradigm. So just a few final words to remember as we, as we do move forward and think about this paradigm shift, of course, we want to be, continue to be engaged in um, truly collaborative research, thinking about building partnership and what it means to be, in this case, operating um, shoulder to shoulder with your um, counterparts. Think about practicing reciprocity and how that changes um, uh, the work that you do and, and um, can actually change the relationship with your partners when you, when you focus on reciprocity. And then, of course, building human capital because I think at the end of the day, it's really about the next generation. And we want to shift the paradigm for, for them so they don't have to, but that they can just naturally step into this um, new paradigm and take global health to the next um, level. So I will finish with these words. Um, you've prob many of you have probably heard them before, but it's the guiding words for our work. It says, if you want to go fast, you go alone. And if you want to go far, you go together. And I think we should be in this for going the distance. Thank you.